Today on the BRS 160, we're going to share some tips on the single most important topic related to maintaining a long-term reef tank, redundancy. Hi guys, my name is Ryan. Welcome to another week of the BRS 160, where every week we do our best to help you guys, members of the reefing community, enjoy your tanks and find new ways to explore the hobby. We do that by following the setup and progression of this 160 gallon reef tank. This week we're going to explore system redundancy, which we need to understand before we start installing any equipment. For our purposes, redundancy means both backup systems and equipment, but also safety fail-safes such as shutoffs, alarms, and notifications. Most of us tend to live in a world where we just expect things to work and often have a misguided impression that it'll work indefinitely, or when it fails, there'll be a limited impact and we can deal with it when it does fail. However, with the reef tank, we're setting up an ocean ecosystem in our living room with a variety of equipment that provides life support to the things living inside of it. Some of the equipment can fail and not be a big deal, but other equipment is so critical that being off or malfunctioning for hours can have some pretty serious impact to that ecosystem that you're taking care of. We also have to consider we have a giant box of water in our living rooms and we want to make sure the water stays inside that box and not on our floors where it could result in some costly repairs. This episode is really about brainstorming all the things we need to consider and looking at all the options for planning a tank like this. We'll show the actual installation of our redundancy solutions when we install the equipment in future weeks. Keep in mind we're going to cover a best case scenario that would be difficult for anyone to implement entirely day one. So just apply what you learned to your current time and budget availability. Adding things in as time goes on is part of the hobby and what makes it fun for many of us. However, implementing many of these elements, at least at their basic levels, often is the difference between a one to two year successful tank and a five to ten. Today we're going to cover the top 10 major systems that your reef ecosystem in your home relies on in order the most common equipment failures and the most likely to cause catastrophic consequences. We'll go over why they are issues as well as present some solutions. The number one biggest failure point on any aquarium and often the most catastrophic is by far temperature related with heaters being the biggest culprit. No way around it, typical aquarium heaters are just not very high quality and the most likely piece of equipment to fail on your tank. When they fail, they can simply stop turning on, which means your tank is going to get cold over the next few hours or days, depending on your home's temperature. Eventually, your fish and corals will die from this stress, but they can often survive quite a while in a cooler tank. Other than putting your hand in the tank, there's really no way of knowing that your heater broke and the tank is getting colder. You likely won't notice until things start to die, which often causes a chain reaction type event where many things die all at once. However, much worse than that is when the heater gets stuck in the on position. Many of you never even considered this as an option, but it happens a lot. So what happens when the heater gets stuck on? Well, the tank gets hot and it gets hot fast. Depending on the size heater you have, you likely have a few to several hours before the tank overheats. The tank's inhabitants do not have the same tolerance for heat as they do cold, so things go south fast. One of the best solutions I've heard for either situation is just replace your heaters every year before they hit the window where they're likely to break. This isn't foolproof, but it's a great preventative measure. In specific relation to failing off, the best solution is to run multiple heaters, so if one fails, there's another one to back it up. You can have both heaters set to the same temperature where they turn on and off together, but since they're cycling on and off an equal amount of times and receiving the same amount of wear, they're also likely to fail around the same time. Many reefers prefer to set up a second heater as a backup, which is one to two degrees lower and positions it as a true backup with very limited use. That limited use means it's more likely to be functional when your primary heater fails and you're relying on this one as your redundancy option for maintaining the temperature of your reef tank. In relation to failing in the on position, make sure your heater is suited to your tank size and not three times as big as you need. In that same thought process, if you run multiple heaters, make sure they don't add up to a ridiculous level of heating power. This will give you more time to do something about it if there's ever a failure where they get stuck on. The best solution to all this is stop relying on the 15 cent thermostats inside many heaters and move on to something much more reliable like an external temperature controller to regulate the tank temperature. Ranco makes a great industrial one a lot of reefers used to use and there's some aquarium specific ones which are super easy to use as well. That said, complete aquarium controllers have become so inexpensive these days and come with so many additional advantages that it just makes sense to spend a few more bucks and get something that's going to do a whole lot more for your tank than just manage temperature. For just over a hundred bucks, you can get a reef keeper from Digital Aquatics. The reef keeper will manage the temperature by controlling power to your heater, set off alarms anytime the temp is outside the desired 
desired range, as well as a whole host of other features related to pH, ORP, timers, lights, pumps, you name it. Another controller option which is a bit more expensive is the Neptune Apex which will do the same things but has a cloud based application to set it up and it's pretty easy to get the Apex to send email or text message alarms if something's wrong with the tank which is ideal. The second most common system failure which can have some pretty catastrophic results is related to your calcium and alkalinity solution. If you have an automated two part system it could overdose the chemicals. If you have a calcium reactor it could overdose the effluent or the pH of the effluent could become too low and there are all kinds of issues associated with automated overdosing of Kalkwasser. Well really high calcium levels could potentially cause serious issues. Our number one concern here is really alkalinity or pH related issues associated with these methods of maintaining calcium and alkalinity. One way to limit the impact two part or calc can have on the tank is just to use smaller containers for each of the solutions which inherently limits how much can be added to the tank but also means you have to fill them much more frequently. The real solution for all three is a pH controller which will turn off your dosing pumps or calc dosing system if the pH ever gets too high as well as turn off your calcium reactor's feed pump if the pH ever gets too low. Same thing applies here, Pinpoint and Milwaukee make some really solid standalone pH controllers which are ultra easy to use, however many of you might elect to invest in a more complete aquarium controller like the Apex or Reefkeeper. The number three most common system failure is auto top off related failures. Auto top offs range from a bucket of water and a level sensing device to directly hooking up your water supply from your RODI system. What differs ATO failures from other system failures is if this one goes wrong it can overflow your tank which is bad for your fish and corals but also can seriously damage your stand and home if it goes uncontrolled for long. If you use Kalkwasser in your auto top off, the best bet is just to use a controller to turn the auto top off off if the pH in the tank ever gets too high. If you're just dosing fresh RODI water, there are a few solutions. One is a cheap moisture sensor which can detect spills and set off an audible alarm. Similar to that, there's some that are also capable of shutting off a valve as well. Many aquarium controllers also have the ability to measure salinity or have leak detector systems which can not only turn off equipment if they detect lowering salinity or water spills, but this is also where the email or text notifications can be the most valuable. This is especially true if you risk hooking up your RODI system directly to your aquarium with a never ending water supply. No matter how much planning and redundancy you implement, something can still happen. For instance, not that long ago a customer told me he planned for everything but never even considered his cat was going to chew through the RODI line. A valve that turns off the water supply based on moisture and an audible email or text notification that this happened is going to be the difference between cleaning up a mess and serious damage. Outside of all that, when you're considering buying an auto top off, get a decent one that has a track record of success rather than the newest gadget out there. Read the reviews and other reefers experiences. In my opinion, the best budget one I've seen is a JBJ and the most trusted one out there is easily the Tunes Oscillator and what I use in almost every case. Number four system failure is return pump failure. These pumps have a limited lifespan and depending on the brand or type I'd expect around two to five years from them in a saltwater environment. However they can also last as little as two weeks if your system is designed in a way that a snail, rock, sand or a big chunk of algae can get sucked into the pump and break the impeller. The biggest problem associated with this is your heaters and other life support are typically down in the sump so if your return pump breaks you have a real issue. No one is going to like this answer but your best bet is to have a spare pump on hand at all times. Again this is where most of us think we'll just get one if we need it but if a local store doesn't have it or isn't open when it breaks it's going to be a real pain to find a solution. You won't like spending money on that spare but you'll sure be happy to have it when you need it. The number five type of system failure is short term power outages. Short term to me means less than 12 hours which are fairly common and typically the result of an average storm, car accident, municipal repairs or brownouts from an overloaded municipal electrical system. With a short term outage the biggest issue is gas exchange and keeping the tank well oxygenated so the fish can breathe. Heat, skimmers and filters are less critical. Promoting gas exchange is pretty easy. We just need to keep the water moving and the surface of the water breaking. Cheapest way to do that is with a battery operated bubbler like this one. Depending on your tank size you might need a few. They come in two options. One that you turn on manually and one that detects the power outage and turns on automatically. Since most power outages are going to happen when you're at work or sleeping the automatic option is obviously better. 
Both Tunes and Ecotec DC controllable powerheads have a battery backup option, which will keep the pumps running for an extremely long time, and also switch to battery power automatically during an outage. Contrary to what many people think, keeping the water flowing like this and breaking the surface of the water is much better at keeping the water oxygenated than air stones or bubblers. Another option is to pick up a $20 to $30 inverter, which allows you to hook up a couple of pumps to run off a car battery. You can find an inverter at most hardware, camping, or automotive stores, or related departments in large retail stores. Some reefers also use battery backups for computers, which also keep the power supplied during a power outage. However, the inverters in these typically are not very efficient at operating very low consumption items like a power head, so you might not be very happy with how long they run the pump during an outage. It could be as little as a couple hours unless you get a giant size one, which would be prohibitively expensive. Number six is aquarium controller failures. Just like anything else in this world, an aquarium controller can fail as well. Power surges, water splashed on them, your dog or cat chews through a wire, your kids pull a wire out, all kinds of silly things. Luckily, this is much less common than other system issues, and most controllers have fail-safes for this. More or less, you just assign the outlet a default on or off position. If the outlet ever becomes disconnected from the main system, it will switch to that state. For instance, I'd set my lights to off. If the system was ever disconnected, it'd be better that they were permanently off rather than on. Same goes for your heater, ozone unit, or top off. However, I want to make things like my return pump, power heads, and skimmer to default to on in most cases. Number seven is plumbing redundancy. This is less common these days with most reefers setting up a Herbie overflow which has an emergency backup or a bean animal overflow which basically has two emergency overflows. But without that, a big chunk of algae, a fish, or even a bunch of snails could easily clog your overflows, which could cause the tank to flood over the edges. This not only cuts your tank off from important life support elements, but also could damage your home. At this point, some variation of the bean animal overflow system is the only type of overflow design I'd even consider, and I feel ultra safe with the dual redundant overflows. You could one-up that with these leak alarms or leak sensors that go with your Apex controller. I guess I'd do that for sure if I had some super expensive Brazilian hardwood floors the tank was sitting on. Number eight is long-term power outages. These are outages that are going to last anywhere from 12 hours to many days. While this is a gigantic pain, many of us have only had a power outage this long a couple times in our lives. However, it happens, we need to start worrying about a long-term flow solution as well as a heat solution. Maybe even lights if it's long enough. Typically, the only time power will be out that long is when a major storm comes through your neighborhood and wipes out large portions of the power grid with tons of downed trees and other issues. In my opinion, the only viable option in this case is a generator. Considering how expensive a generator is and how rare long-term power outages are, and this thing is going to require maintenance so it works when you need it, I just don't think I'd recommend buying one in advance unless you know your grid goes down a lot or want one for other reasons. As long as I have my short-term power outage needs covered, I just buy a generator when I need it. That said, everyone in the city is going to be buying a generator after a storm, so be prepared to be the first one in line or willing to drive pretty far out of town to get it. The ultimate option really is a whole house generator hooked up to your home's natural gas. This isn't cheap, but beyond your fish tank, your family will never worry about power outages again. Nice thing about these is they typically start up automatically, so your tank is protected when you're sleeping at work or even on vacation. Number nine most common system failures related to something most people never consider, which is your home's heating and cooling system. If your air conditioner breaks on a nice sunny day, your home can get hot fast and your tank is going to get hot with it. We also need to remind members of our family the importance of not messing with the AC controls. If you turn it off one day to get some fresh air, it's important to make sure that it gets turned back on. Best solution here again is an aquarium controller, which can turn on a fan if the tank is getting too hot, still too hot, turn off your lights, then non-essential equipment like UV sterilizers, skimmers, media reactors, and of course if you have a chiller, turn on that as well. Even better, something like an Apex can email or text message you that there's a problem so you can do something about it. Opposite is true in the winter with your furnace, but things happen a bit slower in that direction, and most of us have heaters in the tank which can keep up long enough to get your furnace fixed. Notification from the controller is nice in this case as well, and it's always a good idea to have some old heaters around for this instance if you live in a winter state. Number 10 most common system failure is lighting. To be honest, I see a lot of people get pretty freaked out about this when their lighting goes out, but lighting is probably one of the most forgiving components of the light support system on the tank. 
You're trying to emulate the sun with your lighting. So remember that there are stormy weeks with little sun on the reefs all the time. So I don't plan on a lot of redundancy for my lighting. If something goes out, I identify the issue and replace it quickly. For instance, most of you can get a replacement bulb or lighting fixture shipped to you from us in one to three business days, which is more than fast enough. And it really isn't worth purchasing backup lighting options, but you can save your old lighting or bulbs for this if you want it. We talked about aquarium controllers several times in this week's episode, specifically the Reef Keeper and Neptune Apex. I wouldn't say you have to have one to be successful reefing because that isn't true, but you can see how they can be an important component of maintaining redundancy, stability, and notifying you if something's wrong. As to which one's right for you, they really serve two completely different markets, so it's pretty easy to give advice. The Reef Keeper Lite will provide 90% of the redundancies we talked about today, programmable on an easy to use computer interface or on the control panel, and really affordable starting at just over 100 bucks. This is a great option for newer to mid-level reefers who want these redundancies, but also want something that's pretty easy on the wallet. The Apex serves a different market with more advanced options and comes at a different price point but has some pretty cool features. The biggest one is your Fusion interface. You can do most of the programming on the control panel, but the Fusion interface allows you to set up and control your tank from basically any internet device that has a browser like a home computer, tablet, laptop, phone, or even something simple like a Chrome box which makes it super easy and convenient to do. Biggest advantage is the Apex Fusion's email and text message alarm system is easy to use, which means you can get those real-time notifications when something is wrong with the tank. Apex also has a pretty long list of accessories, including an automatic feeder, PAR meter, Ecotech and AI modules, leak sensors, dissolved oxygen, dosing containers, and a variety of other things. They even have their own power heads in development. There's basically no limit to the amount of things you can hook up and control with the Apex. The Apex also has a really robust user community developed, which is eager to help each other and share programming, which is nice. In this series, we're going to install and use individual control options with separate pH, ORP, and temperature controllers because they're the easiest to set up and understand. Towards the end of this series, we're going to replace all of that and install an aquarium controller with a complete setup guide based on all the equipment we added, which should be fun. Next week, we have week five, and we're going to start plumbing this tank. We're going to talk about all the different techniques and then get this thing plumbed and ready for water. You don't want to miss it or any of the future episodes, so start jamming on that subscribe button. If you're interested in any of the companies or products we talked about today, hit this link, check them out, and even read a few of your fellow reefers' reviews. See you next week with episode five of the BRS 160 Plumbing.